Today, Professor Joseph Drew, join me for the third instalment of why we have unsustainable local government. It's really important that you do join me for the fight, that you send these videos around, that you like them, that you subscribe, because we are facing a massive challenge and we keep making the same mistakes and we've just got to do better if we're going to avoid catastrophe. So one important reason why we don't have sustainable governments at any level is because we don't understand the purpose of government anymore. Have you ever asked yourself, why do we have government? You know, after all, we weren't created in the Garden of Eden with government and government buildings and prime ministers and bureaucrats. Governments have evolved over time. They've evolved because they perform a function that private industry doesn't perform and a function that people can't perform on their own. And this function is to cooperate. We need to cooperate to achieve certain goals. The example I always use is public goods such as roads. You know, in medieval times, each land owner was responsible for the section of road that ran past their house. The problem is not everyone put much effort into it and the roads weren't traversable. So we found that we had to cooperate together in order to get public roads that actually work and, and formed a contiguous system. There's lots of examples where we have to cooperate together to achieve things that we couldn't achieve or to achieve things that the market's not interested in achieving because they can't make a profit from it. Now, when you remember that the purpose of government is to cooperate, it entirely changes the way you approach things, as we will see in the next slide. And because we've forgotten that the purpose of government is to cooperate, we've decided we don't have to pay heed anymore to the principle of subsidiarity. Now, this is a Catholic social teaching. It was best explicated by Pope Pius. And he said in 1891 that if we continued this process where government was taking over associations and taking over the things that people used to do and benevolent societies used to do and other lesser associations used to do, that government, government would ultimately be crushed under the burden of the weight of the things that they needlessly took upon themselves. And that is exactly what is happening. Now, the example I give in my books is, is childcare. I can remember when I was a kid, I was brought up by my grandparents, Salvation Army officers. The Salvos used to run childcare for free. Now government runs it, we pay people lots of money and we can't run it in a sustainable fashion. You know, when I was a kid, sporting associations, most sporting associations maintained and mowed their own sport facilities. My uncle was in charge of the, the cricket association up uh, Meribara Way where he lived. And they used to organise the irrigation, the mowing, cleaning the clubhouse, painting the clubhouse, all those things. Now in most local government's areas, I find that council's doing all the mowing, council's paying for the water, council's building the infrastructure, council's maintaining the infrastructure. Now, if we're going to keep taking over things that we never used to do, of course, we're going to become unsustainable unless our taxes are going to keep up with this. But the question becomes, it becomes a question of moral equity and moral development. What people don't realise is that when you take over things you ought not be doing, you are depriving people of the opportunity to get together and do those things and form those relationships and form those collaborative goods and essentially form what we used to have and we were very proud of, community. People used to get together and do things together, and that's how you build community. When we have provider local governments that think they have to do everything, people get in that mindset. People don't get together with their neighbours anymore, don't get to learn about them, don't get the shared satisfaction of pursuing a goal together, and we lose that, uh, that community over time. But more importantly, we end up in the situation where we're taxing the bulk of the population to pay for government to provide, inappropriately provide, for the special interests and the hobbies of some individuals. So in Tamworth, you've probably heard me hear about the talk about this before. We, we've got a $3 million astronomy centre or some such thing because it was a hobby 
of about a dozen people in Tamworth that they like to look at the stars at night. Now the other 60,000 of us are paying to maintain this $3 million facility for their hobby. How is that equitable? Obviously it's going to build resentment. Obviously it's going to build an unsustainable local government. Another reason why we have unsustainable government at all levels is because we deal in fiction rather than deal in facts. It's very, very frustrating for academics because we find facts all the time and we publish them and you can access them. You can download uh, academic papers. Some are free. Sometimes you have to pay a small fee for them. And there's no need for us to believe in fictions that are wrong, but we choose to do so, particularly government inquiries choose to believe so. Now, here's two examples of what I'm talking about. The first paper published in Australia's best PA journal shows that, that as population goes up, unit revenue actually decreases. This is the complete opposite to what local governments keep getting told and what most local governments believe. Most local governments believe that as they grow, they become more financially sustainable. The undeniable empirical fact based on econometrics, the super duper maths I do for a living, long panel of audited data, is that as we get more growth, population growth, our unit revenue decreases, therefore we must be become, becoming less financially sustainable. And the reason for that is rate capping, how the grant system works, and the fact that most fees and charges are access charges, not consumption volume charges. So there's a fact that is completely opposite to what most councils believe. And if they knew what the fact was, they might change their behaviours and avoid a disaster. Here's another fact. Most people believe that shared services as an alternative usually to amalgamation improve efficiency. Well, we did a study based on audited financial data from South Australia where they record what shared services they have in the financial statements, long panel of data done with that super duper econometrics, and it is an undeniable fact that shared services actually reduce efficiency. They increase unit costs by some 8%. It's absolutely ginormous. Now that is a fact. And we need to start dealing in facts instead of fiction. It's as simple as that. And we don't hide the facts. This is what's so frustrating. And this is why I keep saying we need true experts advising local governments and local government ministers so that we start dealing in facts and stop dealing in fiction. And I keep coming back to the same issue because this is the biggest problem for government in the Western world, certainly in Australia. They're these self-professed experts, usually the clowns from the commercial consulting firms who are just there to make money, but not always. Sometimes it's universities. Don't assume that every university have experts there working for them. I know of one university that has no experts anymore, yet they're still running around claiming they're experts and claiming that people are experts who have no scholarly credentials at all and teaching students when they do not have the requisite skills and knowledge and qualifications to be teaching students. That's just appalling. So you must ask for people to prove that they are an expert. The real fault lies with you guys. If someone comes up and says, I'm an expert, say, well, prove it to me. Where are your scholarly publications? Where is this evidence of work that you've done before that's been successful? Where is the evidence of the local governments that you've worked for before who are roaring to successes and financially sustainable? You must get them to prove that they are an expert. And if they're telling you that something needs to be done or something's the case, you must say, well, show us the detailed evidence. It still bemuses me and puzzles me that the New South Wales government did these amalgamations without releasing the modelling from KPMG. No one's ever seen it. It's been held cabinet in confidence. And there's other states doing similar things. If they want you to believe their policy, they should tell you who are the people who wrote these reports, what are the qualifications of these people who wrote these reports, and then provide full day details of the sophisticated, sophisticated, grown up, proper 
empirical evidence that supports what they are saying. If they're not doing those things, they're not true experts, and they're just going to drive you off the side of the financial sustainability cliff. And the last reason I'll cover for why we have unsustainable government is the fact that everyone's hopping on little bandwagons and using these little catchphrases to justify what they're doing. Often they're using the catchphrases inappropriately, and mostly they haven't bothered to, use, to read the work and, and think about the work that they're citing that's supposed to support their position. One is public value. Everyone now is running around, we have to build this aquatic centre because we're creating public value. Well, first of all, define what public value is. That's something that's eluded Mark Moore, who created the concept. And then explain to us how it's moral and how it's consistent with the proper function of government to do these things, particularly if you're not doing the things that are the proper function of local government, such as water and roads and the like. So don't get misled by catchphrases and trends. Ask people to give you good reasons for what they're doing and explain what this concept means that they're touting, which I can almost guarantee they won't have bothered to have read or thought about. Another one is Keynesian economics. Everyone wants to be a disciple of John Maynard Keynes since GFC because they think that's what saved Australia. It didn't. Immigration saved Australia. China's huge, massive fiscal stimulus saved Australia. Keynesian economics did not, and I've proved that in academic papers. Moreover, Keynesian economics ended in disasters in the 70s and 80s in the UK, and people obviously have very short memories. It does matter what you spend the money on. And also, it does matter what tier of government you are. Local government does not have the monetary control over monetary policy or influence over monetary policy that is required to make Keynesian economics work. And Keynesian economics will inevitably end up in huge inflation and huge debt, which is what is the problem that we're grappling with throughout the Western world at present. And it all goes back to the fact that people don't read the source work, they just use these trendy phrases, they don't think about them, and they don't look at the history, and they don't look at the, what the scholarly literature has said when they've been critiquing these things. Look, I hope you found this video helpful. Join me in the fight for sustainable government. Send the videos around. Like them. Subscribe. If you don't join me, we're not going to win. And if we don't win, we're all going to be faced with a catastrophe in the next decade or so. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.